Okay, we are on to uh, item G, which is the presentation on Alaska Tanker Company's ballast water management. Um, before we get started, though, thank you to Anil and your team for coming up specifically for this. And so everyone knows uh, they are on a flight out this afternoon from Anchorage, so they will miss uh, giving their reports or taking your questions this afternoon at that point in time. So before they present, if anyone has any specific questions for Anil about Alaska Tanker Company, Feel free to ask them now, otherwise he'll get into his presentation, take maybe a few questions after that, and then they'll be on their way. So, Anil. So thank you. Thank you very much for making time for us uh, to talk about our ballast water management system, what we're doing about it. Um, my, yeah, no worries. My name is Anil Mathur. I, I run Alaska Tanker Company, and... What I really wanted to do before we start our presentation is introduce my colleagues here who are with me. This is uh, Karen Hayes. Karen's our environmental manager. She joined ATC, Alaska Tanker Company, in 1999. She's a graduate of the U.S. Coast Guard Academy and has two master's degrees from MIT. Um, she also attended the prestigious wartime college uh, with the Coast Guard. She worked at the Coast Guard for 20 years and uh, in, was chief of safety, oversight, and ship design. And she's also got a license as an engineer as well as a mate. So Karen understands this subject very well. We stole her from the Department of Ecology in Washington, where she was a, a supervisor of the Puget Sound office. And next to her is Chris Merton. Chris is our engineering team leader. He's uh, been with ATC since 2002, 13 years. Um, he's, a, he's a marine engineer, and he went to Stanford. He attended the executive MBA program. Uh, he was also an inspector with American Bureau of Shipping. For those of you who may not be familiar, on behalf of the Coast Guard, the American Bureau of Shipping does a lot of the inspections on their behalf of our ships and uh, Chris was actually an inspector for ships in Alaska and in Washington. So normally I come here and babble, but this is a subject that actually requires some expertise, so I'm going to shut up now and let these folks make their presentation. Um, I, can you go to the first slide, please? Before I did that, um, I wanted to, with deep gratitude, uh, acknowledge your a uh, compl compliment to ATC. We've, we've completed 20 million man hours, which is 14 years, with just one lost time injury where a sailor fractured his knuckle. And that's over 14 years, and in those 14 years, we have not spilled a single drop of crude oil uh, to any, any of the nation's waters. So Amanda was nice enough to write this letter, which I immediately showed the workforce uh, more, more the people on the ships, uh, because it's very easy for them to forget how important their work is. And when important people like in this room acknowledge uh, their work, it brings home to them how important what they do is. And it does it in a way that I can't. So I'm very grateful to you for this very nice letter that we got from Amanda. So now let me turn it over to these two folks to do their thing. Thank you for inviting us to come and discuss our, our ballast water program. Um, ATC is very concerned about uh, ballast water and make, ensuring that we do everything we can to protect the waters of Alaska as well as uh, everywhere we sail. And we want to make sure that we uh, work together with everyone to make sure that we, we take all, yeah, and the best action possible in what we do. So what we're going to be covering today are what ATC, ATC has done to support ballast water research. I'm going to quickly summarize the IMO Coast Guard requirements, how they apply to our fleet, and, and then uh, Chris is going to review the, what actions we've taken to assess uh, what systems are available. And then we're going to cover uh, the, pro, the, stat, the current status of the um, Coast Guard uh, type approval system. Um, Coast Guard, you know, Jason, if you want to jump in, feel free. And and then why it's important for ATC to have the best system that's possible and one that's proven. All right, so um, back when ATC 
uh, uh, started in 1999. Uh, we were already involved with uh, I- investigating the most uh, probable, the best possible uh, system. BP had took a look at the systems that were available, and at that time, that they thought that ozone had the most promise of the different ballast water management technologies because it had been around for you know uh, centuries. You know, in terms of applying, you know, since the 1800s. Uh, in its application to the cleaning of, of, of uh, drinking water. So um, BP and ATC together asked uh, NewTek to develop a prototype ozone, ozonination system and, and install it on board the Tonsino, which currently now is the, the Sea River Kodiak. So they, uh, in our dry dock in 99, they installed 11 miles of of uh, piping in, in, in the tanks on the on the uh, Tonsina to see to test that as a delivery method. You know how do you you know what's the delivery method? And then they once they figured out how to deliver it, then they tested to see wh- whether it was an effective uh, use of this in terms of killing um, non uh, non invasive species uh, invasive species. Um, so during the over the next three or four years, we tested that system, and the results were that that they. Uh, they were it, the system, the ozone showed effective against all of the uh, size sizes, with the exception of the large, larger critters, um, the over 50 microns. So that that study resulted in a continuing, you know, recommending further research. Um, so in there, you can see Dr. Herwig, who led the study together with many other researchers, including the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife in Kenai, um, uh, doing sampling on board the Tonsina. So the next, the next, after that, uh, the next opportunity Alaska Tanker had to be able to assist with the research was in the second prototype of the uh, ozone, ozonation system, with, which was installed on the Prince William Sound. Instead of um, doing, putting the, the uh, piping in the tanks, what they did was they, they designed a system, the Mark III system, to be able to deliver the ozone right to the ballast water as, as it was brought on board. They thought that would be a better way and would improve the kill rate for the invasive species. And, and, so, and it did work. It did improve it. Um, at, the surprising results were with that it, the only thing that it didn't kill were the amphipods that were, uh, that were um, between 10 and, and uh, um, 10 and 50 microns, which, is, which was surprising. But again, uh, further testing was recommended in order to try to to really hone in on exactly how, what the best use of this methodology was. So, um, Alaska. After this, Alaska Tanker didn't have another opportunity to, to test ozonation as a system. Um, the company became uh, uh, NKO3 and is now sold uh, as as a comp- as a product called Blue Ballast out of Korea. So and now, it, and as a result of this work and the work that BP and ATC and all the other, all the folks that were participating in this these, this research, it's now available as one of the uh, systems that's are available for purchase. So um, in the next opportunity ATC had to help with the research was in 2008. Um, the Smithsonian uh, Research Center uh, asked ATC if the, if the Alaska Navigator could be a platform for some testing that they were performing on de- developing a technique for how to determine, uh, you know, developing tracers. They were trying to determine a test methodology for determining whether water came from, salt water came from the ocean or salt water came from uh, estuaries because the salinity would be the same. So they uh, en- ended up using, um, like, like tea leaves. I, I, anyway, so they, then they said that, that it was very helpful, the w- work that we did. So they were, so they spent a lot of time on uh, the, uh, <laughs> Um, the, the uh, navigator uh, running their test to, to determine, you know, what, you know, how this method, whether this method would work. Okay, the, and the next opportunity ATC had for, to help out with research was with uh, when the CERC came and asked us if they could sample all of our ships. They, they ended up sampling all of our ships to determine whether, um, w- whether, you know, the proper dual delivery, whether, uh, they wanted to sample all of our ballast water and to see what what exactly we were bringing to Alaska. So uh, they ended up doing six samples, samples of sampling on six of our ships, and so we were very happy to be able to help. Um, and I see that the 
the RCAC has a wonderful uh, section on their website with the showing the you know that many of the all the research that's been done in, done in Alaska and and it's a really uh, we appreciate the work that you guys have done on this as well and um, you know and that you know you can show that there have been 15 uh, invasive species arrive in Alaska and so we need to all work together to figure out a way to make sure we minimize any f any future deliveries. So, so a what ATC has been doing now is uh, our current ballast, ballast water management practices um, is going to be discussed by uh, Chris. Uh, sure. Thanks, Karen. And also, good morning, and thank you for having us. Um, this is my first RCAC meeting, so it's quite interesting. Um, currently, right now, our, our typical operation of our ships is we load ballast um, as we discharge cargo, so either in um, <coughs> southern ports in California, um, Long Beach, San Francisco Bay Area, not typically for our, our ships, but and then <coughs> in Puget Sound. Um, and prior to discharging the ballast, which we typically do in Valdez as we load cargo, we do um, flow-through exchange. Our Alaska-class ships were built with uh, a flow-through system where we can continually fill the tanks, and then there's internal piping um, at the forward end of the ballast, each ballast tank at the very highest point of the tank that then allows the water to overflow directly back over the side. So we do that out at, at sea and not in near in near shore waters. So we'll run flow through for a calculated amount of hours based on the size of the tank, and that gives you a, an idea of how many exchanges you've made of the water in the tank. We also do, um, at times, a complete... Uh, emptying of a tank and then refill out at sea. Um, that is a typical ballast exchange if you didn't have a flow through system. And um, we use a mud um, and sediment dispersant when we load ballast that keeps the mud uh, in suspension so that it uh, limits the amount that it can settle out because I think a lot of the invasive species are in the sediment. Um, so that keeps as much as possible of the mud that comes when you load ballast or silt uh, in ports in suspension so that it goes out with the water as you discharge it, um, doing your exchanges, and it doesn't sit in the tanks. Um, that being said, it's not 100% um, effective, and you do get sediment buildup. So when we have the tanks available for inspection and maintenance, dry docks, we physically remove any sediment that's built up. Um, if you look here on this slide, um, based on the different, uh, there's, there's several regulations that are governing ballast water treatment systems. Um, currently, our vessels are all in compliance by doing the flow through and the exchange that we do. Large ocean going vessels, that was the, the first kind of um, method to mitigate uh, NIS. Um, there are IMO regulations, which are uh, uh, the International Maritime Organization, so they're international regs. Um, then the United States Coast Guard has their own set of regulations and uh, some various uh, state agencies as well. Um, and they all have different uh, or may have different implementation schedules for when you need treatment systems installed. Um, and typically those are based on the age and anniversary dates of the vessels and, and large um, maintenance periods typically associated with the dry docking. Um, so here you see our uh, current schedule for being required to install ballast water management systems. Um, our four vessels are listed and with our current uh, upcoming dry docking schedule. So you can see uh, with current regs, we would be required to install a uh, physical ballast water management systems, treatment systems on the Alaskan frontier in the summer of 2018 the Alaskan Explorer in summer 2019, and the Navigator in summer 2020. And then you can see the uh, Alaskan Legend is the summer of 2016, but note that asterisk. Because there are no current approved um, ballast water treatment systems, we won't be able to install that stall one this summer. So we have an extension from the U.S. Coast Guard allowing us to go um, to the next scheduled dry dock and beyond that. And our hope is that by that time, the manufacturers have gained the necessary approvals and proof that the systems work. Um, you'll see, so there's one of the differences 
of the dates, the under the international regs, the leg, um, the legend wouldn't be due until 2021. And I'll let Karen talk about this. Thing. <laughs> the toughest slide. This is a very complex slide, and I'm going to try to summarize it. Um, this is basic. The, the, uh, we just wanted to show you the the performance standards for ballast water, um, and the important part here is on anybody with the oops, sorry. The um, if you take a look at there, if you take a look at the the standards, there's there's two two standards applicable in California. The interim one, which applies now, and then the final standard, which applies in 2030. Then there's the IMO standards, and then the federal standards, and then the NPDES standards, the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System. So for the most part, the IMO and the federal standards are equivalent. There are two. There is one important distinction I wanted to show you right here. Um, when the IMO, who you know had the hard, toughest work of coming out with the first, the very first set of standards, they said that when you wanted to kill an invasive species, that that it could no longer be viable. So, um, and the IMO standard said that for one of a, a, a standard is, they thought that that meant living or dead. But since then, the in application, they, that just meant that it couldn't reproduce. Some people in, internationally have determined that meant that it couldn't reproduce. Well, since that interpretation had been made when when, it, when the Coast Guard was setting up their standards, they said no, they don't. They didn't interpret viable as being not being able to reproduce. They said no, it means it's dead. So, uh, so when they wrote when the federal standards came out, they they changed the word viable to living, and so uh, um, that's why that's and that's an important difference because now we're starting to come out and see how that's impacting, it, and that's what's holding up this type approval process. Is, is because it, I know I went to, I did some research on this about five years ago, and, and at that time, even the medical community didn't have the capability of determining for sure that, a, you know, a, a technique to be able to, to say is something absolutely dead, is a bacteria, is a living, you know, one little cell absolutely dead. How do you determine that? Well, apparently, since I, I'm not the expert on this, but I'm just reporting what I've read, it, the Coast Guard does now have a standard that they use for dye to determine whether something is, is living. And so, um, so that's so that's really what's driving this. So then, if you take a look, so and then if you take, there's a couple of other differences here in the California standards, which we also have to comply with by 2020. For the most part, the deadlines, as Chris, they overlap with the Coast Guard, which is why we didn't have a separate column for them. But uh, but by 2020, we have to comply with these these uh, interim discharge standards. And if you take a look at it, those are performance standards. Now, the IMO um, and then the, uh, the, well, the, and the federal and the, the other three are all manufacturing test and performance standards, whereas the California standards are only discharge standards. So in other words, when ships go to California, there isn't a piece of paper that they've been given by the ballast water manufacturer that says that, yes, you can meet the California standards. They just have to be able to meet them. And that is an extremely risky operation for ship owners um, because we just don't know how California is going to handle that. And if you take a look at the standards, you know, it would be nice to be able to say yes, you know, by complying with the other three standards that we would be able to meet the California standards because that's what the, currently that's, this is what the manufacturers are being designed to, the, you know, the, the equipment systems are being designed to. But unfortunately, California, when they wrote their standards, they made three changes. They, they said that um, for the larger organisms, larger than 50 microns, there could be no detectable living organisms, whereas the, the other three standards allow for less than 10. Under the smaller one, uh, the 10 to 50 microns, you can see there, the California standard is 1,000 times more stringent than the other three standards. And then in the, uh, for the less than 10 microns, they actually have a standard, which the other three don't even have one at all, for bacteria and viruses. And then um, for the intestinal bacteria, the, they have, uh, it's one-third of the federal standards. And then for the E. coli, it's, it's the standard is 50% is, uh, of what the federal standard is. So there's quite a bit of difference here. And so this is, we see this as a long-term problem for, because for all the work, that, so the, all the work that's being done right now, they're not addressing these issues. 
So we, you know, ATC has to be very careful because this is the most, you know, this is where we take our oil. I mean, the, you know, the oil. So, so we are trying equally to be able to comply with the Alaska standards and the California standards, and you know, most importantly. So I just wanted to show you, and then, and then on top of that, now, as, as I mentioned, these are interim standards. In 2030, the the, fine, the California final discharge standards is zero for all of these, which is almost in, unattainable in my opinion. But, but we'll we'll see, you know, whether how long that that stands. But we, but um, in the meantime, we have to live with these standards right here. Um, so some of the kind of practical challenges that we're faced on the earlier slide. So our first uh, installation date is currently the summer of uh, 2018. Um, we are and have been looking at a lot of these manufacturers who are uh, have developed these systems. Many of them have uh, the IMO type approval. Um, zero of them have United States Coast Guard approval. There is not one U.S. Coast Guard approved ballast water management system currently. Um, there are a number of these manufacturers who have now uh, submitted their applications to the Coast Guard and have started the testing process. Um, they're all quite, um, because it has huge commercial implications for them, so they're very reluctant uh, to share where they are in the process and how it's going. Um, so we don't really have good info on that, and the Coast Guard as well needs to, I think, uh, respect the individual company's proprietary information, and they can't share where they're at with, with it and what's working and what's not. So there are a number of the manufacturers and some that we are interested in uh, and we think will be, um, if they can meet the approval process, will work on our ships. Um, but if we are to make the uh, installation date of the summer of 2018 for the Alaskan Frontier, we need to start um, uh, detailed engineering work this summer and third quarter, fourth quarter of this, this year. Um, uh, Scott showed those nice 3D pics of the piping and stuff. That's actually some of the stuff that we are working on. Um, with, our, with any ship, with our ships, they're built to hold the equipment that they needed to hold at the time they were built. Most of these systems are quite large. Um, big filters, um, power generation equipment, valves, monitoring equipment, and to now try and fit them in our ships in a way that we can maintain them safely, work around them, and that they're going to function is, is quite a challenge. Um, a lot of the equipment, um, whether it, depending on the technology of how it works, there's um, high voltage equipment, um, electrical things that now you're going to have to try to install in our pump rooms, which are hazardous locations for uh, explosive vapors, um, or, or can be. Um, so there's a lot of approvals around that. So we are actually developing a lot of the 3D models, um, similar to what, what those drawings that Scott had shown, um, that we can imp put in, um, overlay the drawings that we get from these manufacturers to say, is this even going to fit? Can we do it? Do we need to add structure? All those type of things. So that's going to, we've done some of that work preliminarily, but we, that's going to start in, uh, in earnest this summer um, in order to purchase a unit most of these systems are about a year lead time from the manufacturers from purchase order to delivery at a shipyard where you can install it so that means in order to meet the summer of 2018 we need to be able to order this by by next summer not uh, to guarantee that we can get it there um, in order to order one we need one that's type approved so that's kind of what we're, what we're facing um, there's just a quick list there. I, I won't go through them all of some of the manufacturers that we're looking at. Um, th this is kind of a very new, and all sorts of different people have uh, trying to build the best mousetrap to, to you know, to meet those standards. Um, so, but just briefly, some of them have ultraviolet technology, UV, electrochlorination, where you take the salt water and, and actually t make chlorine to, to poison the the. the uh, NIS in the in the ballast water um, ozone as we had said earlier that we were involved with early um, inert gas where you take um, and, and uh, combust the hydrocarbon and, and use the inert gas to then inject that in the tank and it makes it um, 
it gets rid of the oxygen so the, it can't support life of, of any of the bacteria or species. Um, I think that's, that's the majority of the technologies that are being looked at. And filtration. A lot of um, work going into automatic back flushing filters that really just actually prevent you from loading the, the largest of the of the uh, species, and, th and that's. But there's a lot of issues with the filters getting clogged and slowing down your load and discharge times. And um, there's some more details on some of the uh, efficacy studies we've done on the different ones and problems of how we rule some of them out. A lot of it is just simple capacity. <laughs> They, they aren't making any systems that um, can load and can, or can treat ballast as fast as we need to load and discharge it. You know, our ships are, are quite large. We load um, and discharge ballast at 6,000 cubic meters per hour. Um, I would have to quick calculate that in gallons, but it's a lot. Um, and a lot of the systems just can't meet that. They can meet smaller, <coughs> smaller product carrier uh, systems, um, bulk carriers, cruise ships, things that don't have the huge volume of ballast that a, a large crude oil carrier has. Um, so. um, we've kind of narrowed it down to two manufacturers that are here on this slide. They are both uh, have applications and are undergoing testing with the Coast Guard. They both already have IMO type approval. Um, they're both electrochlorination systems, so we would load uh, our ballast normally, and then part of the ballast water would be um, siphoned off in a slipstream. It would go through a treatment that actually uses electrolysis to create a chlorine uh, uh, chlorine injection solution that then goes back into the stream of ballast as you load it and kills kills any of the bugs. Um, then those two products, depending on at the dosage levels that's required. Um, would probably either have to be neutralized before you discharge the ballast, so then you're not putting chlorinated water right into the environment, which then would kill the, uh, the local species. Um, or um, the Ocean Saver one actually has some technology that as long as you keep the ballast inside for 24 hours, the chlorine levels dissipate down to levels that you don't need to neutralize it. Because with the neutralization agents, now you're carrying hazardous chemicals that the crew are having to deal with, and you also risk of the systems over-neutralizing and poisoning the local waters that way. And that, that's actually happened to um, uh, some vessels that have had these initial systems and the, where the systems and the automation have, have lost control of it and they've caused harm by trying to neutralize it. So what about some of the challenges there? Yeah. All right. Um, th thanks, Chris. As Chris mentioned, uh, we are, uh, in order to be able to purchase equipment to install it on, a, on our ships, we need to have a system that's received uh, type approval from the Coast Guard. And so this summarizes real quickly what the, where the Coast Guard is on type approval. Um, there are no type approved systems at this point, so we don't have a system to purchase. Um, they, the Coast Guard says that they've, there are 30 manufacturers uh, have filed letters of intent with the Coast Guard with their intention to start a ballast water treatment system, and they have to estimate about half of those are currently testing. Part of the problem is that there's uh, the five uh, approved independent laboratories. They, they, the laboratories also have to be Coast Guard approved. Um, of those five, most of them are booked through 2015 and for most of 16. So it's very difficult for these manufacturers to even get the lab time. Um, the second problem is the, the uh, um, UV, which is also used for drinking water purification, which was a promising system, um, the Coast Guard came out and said that the system that all of these manufacturers have been using to validate their, you know, to perform the testing, it's called the most probable number, that was using the viable system, not, not the living dead system. And so now all these manufacturers, these UV manufacturers are going to have to go back and retest, most likely with, the, with this new dye that the Coast Guard requires. It's called FDA slash CMFDA, but it's a, it's a type of dye uh, testing. So. Um, the Coast Guard is going to be coming out with more information on that, and, and I've read that the classification societies are hesitant to even weigh in on that because I don't know which way, which way this will go, because whether, whether the Coast Guard will accept many, uh, UV systems or not based on that, that issue. So this means that for ATC there are no systems available for purchase. Um, 
So basically, the bottom line is the industry and the Coast Guard and the manufacturers all need more time to work out these issues. So that's where we are right now. Uh, so and the and so we are really taking us uh, being very careful about this because whenever um, because you know having a system like this such that we, it impede our ability to to discharge or manage our ballast water would impede our ability to to operate. Um, and, and given the fact that ATC's mission is the safe, reliable transport of a third of Alaska's oil um, and, and one that generates over 30 percent of Alaska's tax revenues, we really want to be careful and ensure that we do not do anything to impede our mission. Um, one in ten of every uh, barrels, barrel of oil that's carried into both Washington and California is on ATC ships. So we, are, we want to make sure that whatever we do, we, we uh, ensure that our, our mission is, is is fully operational and that and that we can assure uh, delivery of our oil out of Alaska to the West Coast refineries. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Robert Beadle. Thank you for coming. This is a great presentation and uh, looks like you got a lot of horsepower behind it. I'm impressed. Um, what I was wondering is America, the only one doing these standards, is there is there any other system internationally that that could? Well, the IMO is the International Maritime Organization, so that's the international standards. So international vessels, are, some of them already have treatment systems on on board, n newer vessels than ours, because like I said, it's typically by when your vessel is built, um, that are IMO approved. Um, <clears throat> however, the IMO standard. And Karen can help me out. It it's very hard, and it's kind of complicated how they make um, those rules come into compliance. And the way they base that on is that they need enough nations, maritime nations, um, to sign on to it, and those maritime nations need to have enough tonnage of vessels before it comes into effect. So right now, there's. 97 or 98 percent of the requirement of tonnage in countries or some balance there, but they're just missing that last bit. So the actual IMO rules aren't in effect yet. So you have a lot of vessels out there that do have the systems on board, and um, I do not know if they do or don't use them. I know they've tested them and they meet the IMO standards, but they're not required to use them. And those vessels will, are now fitted with IMO type approved systems but they may or may not get Coast Guard type approval. So you're going to have a lot, could have the potential to have vessels that are sailing f foreign, but it come into U.S. waters for sure for international trade that have systems that meet the international regs but don't or won't meet the Coast Guard. And they're going to have to make decisions on do they go and get a different system or stop trading into the U.S. or... You know, that, that's actually going to be a big problem, and it's, it's something that's gone on a lot between the, the member states of the IMO, which the U.S. Is, is a member, and the U.S. Coast Guard, and trying to negotiate that. And Like I said, mm -hmm. Karen knows more about that than I do. No, you did great. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank sure. You. Orson. Uh, that was an enlightening presentation. And I have a comment. It's directed more at my colleagues on the council than to you. Um, so we have this uh, very conscientious, uh, exceptionally safe tanker company who's struggling with an almost unachievable standard for uh, ballast water treatment aboard tankers, and we're also facing a future that may include the export of Alaskan oil on who knows what international flag tankers. So if, if this company is having trouble, how in the world is that going to work safely with foreign tankers coming into Valdez or Cook Inlet? And so I'd say that it uh, marks a particular challenge for the RCAC, both this one and Cook Inlet for the future with the prospect of exports. I therefore think you should support your local tanker company. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, preferably one with the name Alaska in its name. Thanks, Orson. Uh, Wayne Donaldson. 
I was I was wondering, do the regulations for uh, ballast water treatment uh, is it restricted only to on on board, or could it be done um, at the point of uh, taking on product or discharge? You know, could it be onshore. There are regulations, I think, for shore-based treatment facilities. Um, I, I don't have any real knowledge, but they, I know they have that, and it's addressed in the, in the IMO, and that's one of the ways that a vessel can comply if they have a specific trade route or access to a shore-based treatment facility. But I'm not really sure. Uh, yeah, it just seemed like that might be a cheaper way to go, but I... From a shippers, from a shipping vessel company standpoint, you want to make sure that each location you go to, you're able to go. But um, for any, if if there was treatment available at Valdez, that wouldn't prohibit any any vessel from coming in. Yes, I, I would think so. Uh, Marco. constantly adjust its ballast too so that happens out on the open ocean right yep. okay all right any other questions Thane um, Marco's question just popped a question into my head um, with regards to constant exchange of Ballast, and in my own experience on my own fishing vessels, um, the one I have now is optimum for that. The one I had previously was not. Um, and in light of, say, the Cougar Ace and the uh, vessel over there, I believe in the Netherlands or or Sweden, uh, are tankers that have the same difficulties that the auto carriers might have with regards to handling ballast? at sea um, as far as losing stability and that sort of thing I think certainly if it's not done properly they, they can become unstable um, and that's why but with the tank subdivisions and the way that we can um, do ballast exchange in steps and, and maintain stability but it's definitely a concern that you know only the train master and chief officers can figure out how they can do the, the exchange and still maintain stability and also what weather they're in when they do it. All right. Any other questions? Well, we have a trip to D.C. coming up soon, so it sounds like we may have something to, to address while we're there to, to do a weekend to help. So thank you guys so much again yeah. for making this trip up thank here you. and presenting. We, unfortunately, we have another commitment, so we're going to have to leave now. But um, in the summer, we are having a, hope, a joint reception with our CAC, so we'll be spending an evening with you and look forward to more contact at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.